I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is, let me check my 1104. And I'm Christine Nicholas, the chair of the Tourism Advisory Council, so welcome. Um, I'd like to call the names from the RSVP list that I have here. Thank you, Ross. Um, so on the phone, I believe we have Ali Sirota. Are you here? Are you there? All right, Tom Mulroy. I know Tom is there. Here. Okay, very good. Barbara Lee Diamonds, Diamond Steel Spielvogel. Okay. Alexander Stanton. Okay. And Sarah McGinnis from the Catskills. Here. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Uh, Kristen Yarnigan from Long Island. Kristen Hannafin. Lake George, two totally different areas of the of the state, but if you said it fast. <laughs> <laughs> Samantha Hayes. Here. Thanks, Samantha. June Soto. Okay, that was a tentative anyway, I think. Okay. Um, we don't need sure to do that. On the yep, 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 yep. So, um, is there anyone else on the phone that we haven't called? Uh, Dan Fuller. Dan, great. And then we heard somebody else besides and Dan. George. Oh, George. Hey, George. Hey, George. Terrific. Hi. Hey. Uh, so we'll go around the room so we can take attendance that way as well. I'm Christine Nicholas. I'm Ross Levi, Executive Director of Tourism for uh, New York State. Shanique Costin, Experiential Marketing. I love New York. Mark Wilson, International Tourism. I love New York. Heather McKelleny, uh, Tourism Programs and Operations. I love New York. Greg Laduca with Visit Rochester. Lisa Soto, um, Tourism uh, Marketing, Licensing, and Public Relations. I love New York. Sarah Emmer, Tourism Policy. I love New York. Deborah Hughes, National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House. Nicole Mahoney with the Finger Lakes Regional Tourism Council. Eleanor Tatum, TAC. Anna Hackman, Digital. I love New York and ESD. Ralph Tregali, Port Authority in New York, New Jersey. Valerie Nambach, Ontario County Finger Lakes. Rich Gagliano, SVP Marketing, I Love New York. What are you? Uh, Adam Kildove, Paris. Ronnie Weiss, Travel Unity. Chris Gadone, owner of Big Picture Tourism, representing Wine, Water, and Wonders of New York State. Terrific. You got everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, for those of you on the phone, I just want to remind you that we'll be placing you on, on mute to eliminate the background noise. If you'd like to say something, just press star six. You'll be unmuted, star six. And then when you're finished speaking, you can hit pound six to place you on mute again. So, uh, very good. So everybody should have received a copy of the minutes. Uh, Lisa would have extra uh, copies if you need, but are there any changes um, suggested? And do I have a motion to approve the So minutes? moved. Okay, Eleanor. Second. I need a second from the phone. All right, Tom, so Tom Dan. or Dan. Un is it unmuted? Can you unmute? Yeah, I'm mute. Oh. Yep. Oh. Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> motion carries. And it's approved. Okay. Um, so. Originally, we planned to hold this meeting up in Albany uh, to coincide with Tourism uh, Action Day. So obviously, you got the memo. So I appreciate you being here. Um, there, there was a bit of a change there. Um, so there's no single Tourism Action Day, as the industry opted, um, to do a different approach to its governmental advocacy, uh, which I'll be covering. So thank you for your flexibility. Um, We'll start today with an update from the governor's proposed uh, 2021 executive budget, as well as the advocacy work by the industry, followed by the I Love New York report, Ross, and then we'll hear from two guest speakers, Nicole, whose organization Break the Ice Media works with TPAs in the Finger Lakes region, <coughs> and Deborah Hughes, thank you for joining us, who heads the National Susan B. Anthony <coughs> Museum, um, which is very exciting always, but especially this year, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you'll be updating us on the tourism activities uh, surrounding the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and giving women, that gave women the right to vote um, <clears throat> and the Susan B. Anthony 200th birthday celebration. Um, 
So as far as the executive budget, you'll remember during the last meeting, we reviewed all the tourism related announcements from the state of the state address of which there were many. Since then, the governor has laid out his budget proposal for the year, providing more information on how much funding several of those pro projects and programs will receive if approved. Um, to date, uh, what has been proposed includes $57.5 million of the New York State Tourism Campaign to attract visitors from around the world, which is level with the proposed amount from last year's executive budget. This includes $15 million for the 10th round in competitive funding through Market NY and $3.85 million for the Tourism Promotion Matching Grants. Also, um, New York Power Authority Board of Trustees has approved and authorized $300 million proposed for the Reimagine the Canals initiative over a five-year funding plan. Additionally, the NIPA Board has approved an additional $30 million for projects taking place in 2020. Those projects include um, a project that will connect SUNY College at Brockport to the Empire State Trail and the village of Brockport through a pedestrian bridge and overlook, an interactive hydro-powered illumination of canal movable dams, initially in Amsterdam and Kana Johari in the Mohawk Valley to celebrate the canal's heritage and history, the development of a canal-side pocket neighborhood in Madison County demonstrating a model for 21st century canal-side living, and a new whitewater destination at the north end of Cayuga Lake near Seneca Falls to increase ecotourism and sport visitors to the region. And finally, development of hospitality and recreation destination at Guy Park Manor with a pedestrian bridge constructed across the canal lock to provide access to the Empire State Trail on the opposite side of the river. That's the picture. That's it right there? Yeah, on the top. With the, on the rendering on the, the top. top, yep. And then the and white bottom is the white water. Oh, that's amazing. That's going to be very exciting. Number three, a record 300 million was proposed again for the renewal of the Environmental Protection Fund, which is the highest sustained level of funding in the program's 25 year history. EPF appropriations include funding that would impact the tourism industry with 89 million for parks and recreation, 152 million for open space programs, and 20 million for the climate change mitigation and adaptation program, which includes funding to mitigate overuse of protected lands as a re result of record-breaking levels of visitation in some areas of the state. Tourism industry advocacy. As I mentioned earlier, we usually hold this meeting in Albany to coincide with Tourism Industry Lobby Day, um, formerly known as Tourism Action Day, and this day was organized to bring dozens of tourism stakeholders to Albany to meet with the legislature and advocate for funding and other needs. This year, the industry is trying this new strategy to advocate with elected officials. So instead of hosting one formal lobby day, statewide tourism organizations are utilizing different avenues to discuss specific tourism-related needs with elected officials. And some are doing Albany-based meetings, either together or on their own. Um, some are doing meetings here in the city. For example, uh, today NISHTA is meeting in Albany with, well, with representatives from groups like NYSTEA, NYSDMOs, CONI, SANI, and the Business Council, and for any newcomers here, we're going to have a test at the end to see if we can figure out what the acronyms are. Um, other groups are providing their member organizations with information on statewide tourism issues that would allow advocates to seek out their representatives on their own. While many of the issues that are being discussed overlap, tourism stakeholders are using this strategy as an opportunity to discuss the topics that are most relevant to their work. Some of these issues include Supporting an increase to the Tourism Matching Grants program, supporting the governor's budget for the I Love New York program, supporting legislation addressing concerns regarding unregulated short-term rentals outside of New York City, supporting the creation of tourism improvement districts for counties and cities with a population of one million or more, opposing legislation to begin the school year before September, which would impact the tourism industry workforce, supporting legislation that protects organizations from ADA website litigation by setting an appropriate web standard for people with accessibility issues. And if you would like more detail on these topics, Sarah has a handout that was created by NISHTA to provide greater context to the points I just mentioned. So, um, we have a recent announcement that is not in the PowerPoint. Finally, I'd like to mention that earlier this week, Governor Cuomo announced a $20 million airport capital grant program for airports across New York State 
to support safety improvements, modernize operations, and increase general and business-related aviation capacity. This funding is in addition to the $200 million Gover Governor Cuomo made available through the Upstate Airport Economic Development and Revitalization Competition that supports projects aimed at improving the customer experience and expanding terminal facilities in six airports across New York State. Um, that is all for me. Um, I think I do want to discuss a little bit about the ads, which I can do in new business. So I'm going to hand it over to Ross now uh, and your amazing team at I Love New York to tell us what you've been up to and what we can expect moving forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, February is an always uh, an interesting meeting, late February, early March, because it's a little too early to get into summer and it's a little on the tail end of winter. Uh, but certainly I can let you know about uh, all the exciting work that's been going on over the last month, two months since we've met um, promoting winter tourism in New York. Um, so, for example, just last weekend, or sorry, two weekends ago, feels like last weekend, <laughs> on February 16th, uh, I was up at the Hotel Saranac, and obviously in Saranac Lake, um, along with uh, the governor and about 150 of our uh, tourism best friends, um, and not just tourism, but elected officials, other opinion makers, um, for a governor's press conference uh, announcing a free snowmobile weekend for all out-of-state and Canadian snowmobilers. You will remember the governor has generally announced this every year, sometimes with an event, sometimes not. Uh, this was a really great one. There's a picture of the governor at the podium up there on the screen. Um, this uh, weekend will be taking place March 14th and 15th uh, when all registration fees are waived for out-of-state snowmobilers um, that will allow them to enjoy our 10,000 miles of groomed trails, some of the best snowmobiling in the nation. Uh, for example, the Tug Hill Plateau is generally seen as the snowmobile capital of America uh, because of all the snow they get. Um, so uh, this gives an opportunity, everyone who snowmobiles in New York, you know, you register your snowmobile here so you're all set. If you come with an out-of-state registration, normally you have to buy a temporary uh, registration for your snowmobile. This weekend you don't have to do it. So it's supposed to be an incentive for people to come and enjoy New York State snowmobiling. How much is the registration? It's not a ton. Uh, but I want to say it's like a hundred ish, oh, well, but you know, it's an incentive. Oh, yeah. um, it, in conjunction with the weekend, I Love New York is doing a digital and social media campaign to back it up. Um, and um, it, that is in addition to our overall $4 million winter tourism campaign that you heard me talk about in our last meeting. I showed you uh, the commercials for. Um, and that campaign features snowmobiling as well as the wide array of winter activities, um, not just in our television ads, but print and digital advertising, our PR, our social media, et cetera, et cetera. So this is even in addition, uh, though integrated with that work. The governor also announced that the state awarded $4.2 million to local governments for trail maintenance and grooming statewide. Um, we have sort of an interesting model here in New York State uh, that uh, the maintenance of our snowmobile trails is done by local clubs uh, with fees collected through that registration through the State Department of Motor Vehicles um, and deposited into the Snowmobile Trail Development and Maintenance Fund. Um, and then the county and municipal governments distribute those grants to about 230 snowmobile clubs across the state um, and they do the grooming and the maintenance. So it's, it's a really kind of mm -hmm. cool top-down, bottom-up model. Um, and so uh, the governor was excited to be able to support this. We realize how important this uh, activity in this industry is for New York State tourism. Um, we thought we would show you the 30-second digital spot that we have running to back up the campaign. There's nothing you'll love more than snowmobiling in New York State, especially when it's free, with no out-of-state registration fees on March 14th and 15th. There's endless opportunities to explore the stunning New York State landscape with over 10,500 miles of groomed and marked trails. And there's no better time to experience the beauty of winter in New York State. Free snowmobiling on March 14th and 15th. Visit iloveny.com for more information or to plan your trip. So that's a digital campaign that's uh, focusing on people who are you know doing snowmobile searches and those kinds of things. And also targeted only those out of state. So it'd be an efficient buy. We obviously don't want to tell people in New York about this, so it's only the neighboring states within drivable distances in Canada. So uh, so that was the snowmobile campaign. 
Um, this is also part of um, some other Adirondacks efforts that we've been doing around winter. Um, so, for example, uh, we partnered with the Olympic Regional Development Authority, ORTA, to support the Empire State Winter Games, uh, an annual event that happens, and uh, this year was January 30th through February 2nd. It's a multi-day sporting event that brings 2,100 athletes of all ages from across New York State and beyond, uh, including 15 states and three countries, to compete in over 30 winter sports events in Lake Placid. Um, the Games were celebrating their 40th anniversary this year, and it featured events such as push para bobsled and collegiate ski jumping. Um, and so I Love New York activated at the Olympic Conference Center during athlete registration with a, a bobsled a gift selfie station you can see there, uh, and consumer engagement, a great way to talk to these folks who are coming to the event and let them know if you love being active and you love outdoor recreation, there's all kinds of opportunities in New York State that you're going to want to take involved with. Uh, and we were able to collect 335 emails at the event, so those are folks that we can continue a, a marketing relationship with beyond just this event. Um, it's a big time for the Adirondacks. Uh, the Empire, not only is it the 40th anniversary of the Empire State Games, but of course it is the 40th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice. Um, the uh, inspiration uh, for us, that was an inspiration to talk about the Olympic uh, facilities in uh, Lake Placid in a new way. And so we sponsored a fam trip to Lake Placid with travel writers from Trip Savvy and Inside Hook and Family Vacation Critic. Uh, they spent a week or a winter weekend exploring the Lake Placid area. They stayed at the Whiteface Lodge. They rode the new gondola, uh, the bobsled at the Olympic Jumping Complex, and even visited a maple farm. Um, and uh, there's already been an article published on Inside Hook on February 20th, and we're expecting more coverage from that fam trip. So those are some of the winter activities we've been up to. Uh, last time you heard me give a quick sneak preview, and uh, did my colleague Danae Jones up in Albany gave a quick sneak preview of the New York Times Travel Show. It's happened, so that's great. Uh, January 24th through the 26th at the Javits Center. Uh, we were an official bronze sponsor for, I think it's the third year. Um, that The most important reason that we do that sponsorship, besides getting a lot of free exposure through the New York Times, we were in the Sunday Magazine, we were in the newspaper, um, we have signage all over the place. Um, is actually so we can have a powerful I Love New York row uh, and make sure that uh, we have 25 contigu contiguous partner booths next to us. Um, so we literally had 19 local TPAs and other industry partners with us. You can see the row there. We're able to brand it and really give people a sense that you have arrived in New York State, which the New York Times travel show is important because obviously the majority of the people going to that show are New York City residents. So I remember the day that we would have a few booths and we'd be like, oh, you want to find out about vacation in New York? And they say, oh, I live here and keep on walking. Sometimes we'd get them in. But, um, but it's so much easier to give people the sense of this is something they're going to want to explore when you have that sort of visual presence and people are seeing a, a, a simulated fireplace from the Adirondacks or um, you know Long Island is giving away prizes. And um, so we're able to have that big effect that we really want to have. Um, we also had hired our <coughs> ambassadors who are working the aisle. In most, in past years, they've been in a booth, and this year they were sort of allowed to go mobile, and they were sort of had these uh, outfits. What would you call them, Shani? Kind of these outfits with these built-in video screens, uh, so they were walking around that people were able to see, um, and so that really allowed us to engage with uh, the visitors to the aisle in a, in a very engaging way, um, and allowed them to serve also as sort of a welcome concierge for the aisle. That was kind of the purpose, is as they were greeting people and talking through, they could get a sense of what interests them and send them to the right partners, you know, if they cared about skiing, you could send them to the Adirondacks, et cetera, et cetera. A total of 34,000 consumers, travel trade show professionals, and media attended the show overall. Uh, we had 960 unique visitors uh, complete our travel buddy quiz, which the brand ambassadors were doing on uh, screens with them. Um, so those were names we were able to connect. I did a number of interviews with Travel Trade on Friday, which was a trade day, travel journalist day. Um, this was also the first year that we partnered with the LGBTQ pavilion at the travel show, which had a big expanded presence this year that they haven't had in past years. We were able to activate in what was called the exit area. So as people were in <coughs> this area and leaving, we were able to drive them just two rows over to our row. And actually, we gave them a I Love New York Rainbow Heart button and said, if you show this button over to the brand ambassadors, you'll get another prize. So it was really a way of, of driving traffic over 
to meet our partners. Um, as part of that, we hosted a trivia game show, basically, that I hosted called So You Think You Know New York. Um, and that was great. It was designed to engage uh, LGBT travelers to think about New York State as a vacation destination. We were giving away items. And it was very satisfying that even when I said, all right, so this is the last question, and I finished, people didn't get up and leave. They actually stayed <laughs> for the, the four-minute wrap-up. So that told me that people are actually engaged in learning about New York State. Um, as a result of that partnership, we collected another 3,000 emails uh, and also got to network with other organizations in that pavilion. So overall, I think it's very safe to say that the Times Travel Show is a big success. Um, we've done some uh, international efforts. Uh, we uh, went to Holiday World in Dublin, Markley specifically, uh, January 24th through 26th. Uh, led a New York State delegation to the Holiday World Show. It's Ireland's largest and best attended annual public exhibition. Uh, it has 696 exhibitors from dozens of cities and countries from all over the world. The ability for New York to sell itself to the Irish market, which is very important to us. Uh, 1,200 trade in attendance uh, and a total of 77,850 uh, trade and uh, public consumers. Uh, Duchess and Orange counties attended with us. And while I'm on international, I uh, probably should uh, say a moment about contravirus because I think that it's obviously on everyone's mind. Um, we are watching it carefully, obviously, and monitoring the situation. Um, you know, one of the things we can do now, one of our strategic goals is to make sure we're maintaining good relationship with the tour operators that we've been working with for years in China, because right now, though things are a little bit, at, obviously, at a pause, more than a little, uh, at a pause, we want to have those relationships, and so we're ready to go as soon as things, you know, subside a bit there. Um, you'll also remember that when we were talking about our international strategy in previous meetings on our China approach, in addition to our in-market activities, we also have been uh, working with U.S.-based uh, Chinese tour companies. They were working not only with Chinese visitors from China, but recently immigrated Chinese Americans here. Um, so in a way, for a while now, we have had kind of a dual approach for at least this past year of working not only with the inbound market, but with Chinese Americans now, or Chinese immigrants, local. or Chinese, yeah, local. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way to supplement this as well. So for right now, it's kind of a, a watch and see what we can do situation, but those are at least some of the things we're doing to make sure uh, we are ready to go when things uh, improve, uh, and that also looking for opportunities to supplement that market during this time right now. Just while we're on that, Ross, and with Rich, with you here, I'm just curious if knowing that um, Niagara Falls and the, um, the Glass Museum, right, the Corning Museum of Glass, those two attractions are, you know, probably have a higher percentage of Chinese visitation um, than others. And I'm wondering if we should be pivoting the way you have said that we have, but maybe pivoting to doing in-market advertising to promote those two attractions just to try to help, you know, because I'm sure they're going, they're probably suffering much more than, you know, the Empire State Building or, or you know, like... 80,000. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, if, if we can think about doing that, maybe you can... Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I saw John that. Percy just last week. He's the mm -hmm. uh, the head of the uh, Greater Niagara Tourism Promotion uh, Agency. Uh, you know, he didn't. He wasn't sounding alarm bells with me yet. Right. But I do think it's a great idea to check in with our partners, the ones that are particularly dependent on Chinese market, um, to see, you know, what you know, ways right. we can support. It's good. Idea. And can we shift some digital dollars? That's you know yeah. relatively flexible budget there to do some more targeted things specific. I know we don't typically do specific attractions with a lot of paid media behind it, but in this situation, we could look into see what we can do if they need that kind of help. Great, great. Um, so uh, onward from international, uh, wanted to mention some of our uh, industry support activities. Um, particularly around sort of education and research for the tourism industry, which is an important role that Division of Tourism uh, plays. Uh, we are currently working on updating our visitor profile for New York State. Uh, every eh, roughly four years, three years, five <coughs> years, New York State has done a visitor profile uh, for our partners across New York State. Um, and um, <coughs> it tells them, basically gives them, as the name implies, a demographic profile of who it is that's visiting 
uh, the different regions of the state. How far away did they come from? How long did they stay? What did they do? What was it that motivated them to come, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been a number of years, I think five, since New York State has done this. Um, so we're happy to be doing it again. Our local partners have been clamoring for it for a while now. Um, and so uh, this, um, we have engaged uh, a vendor to conduct the research and produce a visitor profile uh, that we hope will be coming uh, late this spring of this year. Uh, we know that our partners uh, really rely on this information, uh, our TPAs, our DMOs, our industry partners. It helps them put together their marketing plans and helps inform us, of course, on a statewide level as well. Um, it'll include um, demographic data on domestic visitors for 2019. It will be broken down by the 11 vacation regions. Um, and then once it's compiled, we'll release it to our partners. Uh, and we'll also, of course, keep the TAC updated on that as we have that information as well. Um, and then industry education efforts as well. Uh, you, you're probably well aware that over the years, uh, we do a number of, of efforts uh, to bring uh, trends, ideas, best practices, skills, and knowledge building to the industry. Um, we haven't done that as regularly or as robustly as I think we could. Um, like I said, we, we've done a, you know, uh, China ready workshops on and off, um, but we're really making a, a concerted effort now, uh, particularly with Heather here um, doing our industry relations and our program work. Um, we have a little more capacity uh, to do on a sort of a more consistent and regular basis um, these sort of efforts for our industry. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, we're working on uh, hopefully having a, a industry all-day industry workshop at the end of March here in New York City uh, to talk about accessing new audiences and uh, bringing the results of our senior tourism research we did, our accessibility tourism research, um, you know, do an update on the. Uh, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act and the Human Rights Law and what that means for the tourism industry, have our international reps talk about trends that are happening there. So we're projecting for that to happen at the end of March, but we're hoping basically at least every other month to have, whether it's a webinar, to have workshops, maybe we might go regional around the state, uh, but really having a, a, a consistent way of bringing skills and knowledge to our industry, recognizing that you know we have very sophisticated partners out there and a lot of them could run educational uh, workshops for us. Um, so we don't pretend to come in and saying we know all and you don't. But we do know that a lot of our partners um, are smaller, have less capacity, and this is useful. Uh, even our more established partners, there's always new information. And like I said, there's studies and things we've done that will hopefully be bringing a real value add to their work out there. And then the last thing I just wanted to talk about was our intergovernmental work. I think you've heard me talk about uh, the interagency task force, uh, which is a statutorily required body, um, but that had been kind of moribund for the last couple of years, but is now meeting regularly under Sarah Emmert's leadership um, that has met four times, three, three times, three times already uh, in just like a, a year and a half, if not even less than a year, year at this point. Yeah. Um, but the goal is to work, meet basically quarterly. Um, and we last met in February 6th in Albany, 17 state agencies were there as long as, as well as a rep from the office of Senator Jose Serrano, who's the chair of the Senate tourism committee. Um, we were able to recap our work, of course, uh, to let them know what we have been doing at I Love New York. Uh, other agencies were able to report on the work they have done that involves visitation and tourism in New York State. Um, and, and this is particularly timely and important now. When you have these sort of multi-agency projects, you hear about like the reimagine the canals. That's not just canals. Parks is involved. We're involved. EC is involved. Um, same thing with the Empire State Trail. That's a multi-agency effort. Uh, the extension of the state fair that's been proposed, the improvements of the airports, the important historic anniversaries like suffrage. Uh, these pr meetings provide really a good way, a systemic institutional way, to keep all st state agencies updated on tourism-related work and provide opportunities for brainstorming and collaboration. I think I may have mentioned at a previous meeting, literally just people being in the room and sitting next to each other has led to projects that they've worked on. Um, so we're, we're happy that this is going and look forward to it to continue. And that is a, a quick overview of over the last, whatever it was, six weeks since we met last, uh, what we've been up to at I Love New York. Great. Any questions for Ross? Can we get any stats um, from our partners like over the last few months to see if the coronavirus is how it is affecting them? We can ask. It's a little soon for them to have those kinds of stats. Uh, like I said, at this point, it's mainly anecdotal. Right. Um, I mean, I've certainly seen national stats that were looking at things like 
how Ebola worked out and making comparisons because- But just both, just seeing if spend is down. Yeah. Oh, if for like- Yeah, probably not this quickly. I mean, generally it takes a couple months for reporting to come in. Um, well, I guess they'll have, well, they'll have monthly spends in like at least shopping destinations, like the shopping areas. Yeah, even that takes them like three weeks to get those stats together. So, but we'll, you know, like I said, we're certainly trying to monitor the situation. Uh, like we expect there'll be an impact. Yeah. I did read um, NYC and companies' projections, and interestingly, they had downgraded the projection for China before this had even happened. Is um, you know they were saying the market was either softening markedly. I don't know if you've heard this in in some of the trade shows that you've been in. Yes. Um, so it's it's something that they're addressing, you know, and they're monitoring. And you can go on NYC. Um, NYC, what is it? NYC Go. 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 NY Go. Yeah. NY, NYC Go. Yeah. And they do have sort of, they have um, more up to date information, but that's the city. Um, but so they're taking a look at it. Mm -hmm. And then besides the, the, the Chinese market in particular that you're looking at, um, we're going to be a better strategy in general because it looks like things are you know, hopping all over the world now in terms of general out-of-state tourism to New York and are we focusing on you know more national besides the five-hour drive time to New York um, yeah I mean we're we're in the planning process now in general for looking for the upcoming year um, you know the, our fiscal ends on April 1st you know in theory there isn't a New York State Division of Tourism after April 1st, unless the legislature says so. Um, but that says uh, that that's not the way it's looking, thankfully. Um, and so we're this is we're in the planning process now. So these are it's it's actually kind of an opportune time for us to look at the strategy and where we're going and what we're doing. It, it may make sense to take a look at long haul and see if there are different opportunities. Uh, you know, I'm not sure we any of us would claim that we have. Uh, exhausted the five hour drive time. Um, so it, it may be a matter of doing bigger or more. But I mean, obviously, it's a changing situation. We're going to have to monitor it very closely. Oh, right, in Canada, right. Yeah, that we, you know, we have a, a new rep in Canada that we just hired last year. So we have more opportunities there as well. So yes, we'll right, be and we've been talking about just at the early stages, but exploring, like I said before, more um, interest targeting versus just limiting to the drive time. You know, maybe if we talked about when we talked to the Canada rep, if there's someone in, it makes sense to do a small digital targeted, even a test campaign in Vancouver for people that have a specific, you know, um, interest in things that we're offering, let's try that out. With okay. digital, we have the flexibility to not spend a lot of dollars behind it, but we can mm -hmm. test and get some learnings. And if we see there's some um, traction there, we can always invest more in those types of. Uh, yeah, and looking at at where there are particular opportunities, for example, with airlines. So, you know, knowing right. that there are direct lines from Western Canada, it may make sense to do where there's a line. Australia is already doing that with Air New Zealand that just started uh, flying to Newark this year. So, um, yes, looking for those opportunities, it's always what we're doing. Okay. Thank you, Ross. Great, thanks. Well, we're excited to welcome our guest speakers today. Nicole Mahoney and Deborah Hughes. And Nicole, you are here on behalf of the Finger Lakes Regional Tourism Council, the official promotion agency for the 14 county region. And you're representing Lisa Burns, who uh, I understand wasn't able to make it today, but very happy that you're able to be here. Um, and you've been with the council for 10 years, I believe. So, and also, I have to say, Nicole does an amazing podcast, which promotes the tourism industry. Um, so, welcome. And also, Deborah Hughes. President and CEO of the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House, holding this position since 2007. Um, during her tenure as president, the Anthony Museum has completed a major phase of restoration to the National Historic Landmark, secured its absolute charter as a museum, and dramatically has grown attendance while staying true to its mission and vision. And Deborah has spearheaded innovative programming and events, such as the 2017 award-winning Votilla which you want to hear about, and the upcoming Vote Cadre? Votercade. Oh, Votercade. Votercade 2020. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing what's in store, so welcome. Thank you. Well, um, I'm really excited to be here, and Lisa Burns, who is the Executive Director for the Finger Lakes Regional Tourism Council, was very excited to be here, and so she uh, sends her apologies that she wasn't able to make it. Um, and hopefully I will give as passionate of a 
of a presentation as she would give because she's very passionate about this. But I am as well, being a, a woman from the Finger Lakes and a woman um, business owner in the Finger Lakes, I'm really excited about Celebrate 100 and, and the work that the region is doing. Um, so I think we wanted to start just to say why the Finger Lakes. And that is because in the Finger Lakes in 1848, I think it's the next slide, we have a little timeline, but that was when the first <coughs> Women's Rights Convention was held in uh, Seneca Falls, which really kicked off the uh, movement um, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as Susan B. Anthony and many others who lived in the area uh, at the time they all convened in 1848. Um, you can see on the timeline, but a couple things I wanted to, uh, to note is, um, in 1872 is when Susan B. Anthony was arrested for uh, voting in the presidential election. And um, it was so notorious, and I'm sure Deborah can tell this story much better than I can, that they weren't able to try her in Rochester, New York, where she did vote. They had to take her to Canandaigua, New York, which is Ontario County uh, nearby for her trial. Um, we also have Harriet Tubman, of course, who's from, uh, who uh, located in Auburn, New York, and was very active in the civil rights movement. Um, and we also wanted to note that New York State, very proud to be from New York State in 1917, uh, is when women won the right to vote here. But the reason why this is Celebrate 100 is because the 19th Amendment was adopted in uh, 1920. <coughs> So I think on the next slide, um, as a region, we've been talking about what are we going to do about the 100th year. Um, we started talking about it last year. And, and yeah, right, well, for a while, right. Um, but really, last year, we were trying to talk about, as the 14-county uh, TPA um, organization, how can we bring this uh, anniversary to all 14 counties? And some of our counties don't have some of the historical significance, perhaps, in the women's rights movement. But one of the things that we found was every county, though, has empowered women, has female business owners, has female creators. And so the campaign that sort of morphed from the conversation at the regional ta table is something that's women created, women focused, and women empowered. And so the next slide talks about what the campaign is, which is really 100 ways to celebrate women empowerment. And what we're so excited about with this is, is using the, uh, the anniversary as the reason, but giving an opportunity to really showcase all of the assets throughout the entire region um, and to really kind of tap into this trend of meaningful, transformative, curated travel that, that is trending, trending right now. And so some of the themes that we've come up with, of course, the historical component is really important, but also women-led workshops, female foodies, empowered overnights, um, women in craft beverages, um, and uh, women in education, et cetera. So um, that is how the entire region is able to embrace this anniversary. And I think if you go to the next slide. Um, so we do have a campaign logo that was created by Cindy Harris, who's a local female graphic designer, our uh, Celebrate 100. And then on the next slide, we've created a uh, landing page within our regional website um, that talks about Celebrate 100. And on the next slide, I think you can see a segment of that where we highlight the empowered overnights. And, and each section of those themes that I talked about pulls out all of those assets throughout the region so that a visitor can easily find um, you know, what they're looking for based on their interests. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is a digital women's history trail on our website as well to encourage exploration across the entire region. And um, we are also using this in other efforts, which I believe the next slide talks about the New York Times travel show. So that's Lisa there on the left next to Danae. Uh, and Christine <coughs> Wirth is uh, next to Ross. Christine is our board chair. And so they were at the New York Times travel show talking about everything Finger Lakes, but they said they couldn't get away from the conversation about Celebrate 100. There is a, a lot of interest out there. People are really excited about it and um, excited to see what we have to offer. Um, on the next slide, this is collateral that we had handed out, which I'd hoped to bring, but um, I, we're out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's wonderful, but we had that for the New York Times travel, travel show as well. And on the next. And then public relations. So as a region, one of the big initiatives that we do as a 14-county collaborative is a public relations program. 
And um, we, have, we work with Quinn PR down here in New York City. They have been pitching this for us starting last year. Um, we've gained a lot of traction. Um, and right around the New York Times Travel Show, Lisa and Christine did some dust side visits with Travel and Leisure, Fodders, Condé Nast Traveler, and they all are very interested in, in doing stories um, and doing some fam tours. And the next page, I think we show some of our early uh, hits. So total campaign impressions to date is already at almost 54 million impressions um, with really great coverage in New York Times, Bloomberg, Travel and Leisure, Boston Globe. So a lot of momentum is building and we're only in February. So we're very excited about that, um, especially with the opportunities that are coming up in March with uh, Women's History Month. And then again in August with the actual anniversary. Um, so uh, in addition to that, all of our TPAs are doing their own collaborations or promoting their own events, such as the Susan B. Anthony House. So I just did a little roundup here uh, to share with you other things that are happening. Um, five of the counties within the, re within the region are doing a paid campaign where Brave Women Winter that is running uh, now. And there's a microsite called bravewomenflx.com, which actually goes right to a microsite within our Simple View website, our regional website. Um, there's a social media hashtag. It's the counties of Cayuga, Ontario, Seneca, Monroe, and Onondaga. And they are actually talking about making this more of a year-round campaign as well. They've had really good success so far. Uh, the next one, I will let Deborah talk about Vordercade when it's her turn to talk, but that's also uh, an event within the region, and we'll go on to the next one. Um, Harriet Tubman weekend is coming up March 6th through the 8th in Auburn, New York, citywide celebration, and it's um, hosted by the New York State Equal Rights Heritage Center, which we're really excited and proud to have uh, within the Finger Lakes region. Uh, next one. In Rochester, in addition to Susan B. Anthony, um, the Memorial <coughs> Art Gallery has an exhibit, as well as the George Eastman Museum and the Rochester Museum and Science Center. So as you can see, um, you know, a lot of people are getting on board, and we're just trying to really capture all of these programs as they're being announced, and it's all being rounded up onto our regional website, which I will note does connect to the I Love New York uh, website, so we make sure that we're consistent. Um, and the next, uh, so in Chemung County, the National Soaring Museum is doing an exhibit dedicated to American women who have contributed to the sport of soaring. So it just really shows you kind of the creativity throughout the whole region. Um, in Ontario County, Ganondagon State Historic Site uh, is also hosting, and I'll have to ask Vale to help me to pronounce the he the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee uh, women. Uh, from the time of creation exhibit. So again, um, you can see this goes far and wide. And the next one, and this one is really fun. Um, there is a new brew pub opening up in Tioga County, and they are creating a beer that honors Belva Lockwood, and they're going to be charging men more than women to highlight the <laughs> quality. So our PR firm is going to have a lot of fun with that one. Um, and then the next. Um, and just so our continued efforts, uh, we are participating in the I Love New York Spring Media Marketplace. I know our team has been talking, I think, with you, Lisa, maybe the other day about the interactive display that we're going to be uh, having there around Celebrate 100. We're constantly adding new events and exhibits to our Celebrate 100 page. Of course, the ongoing PR efforts and continued content creation. So uh, a lot going on and a lot to be excited about. Terrific, Nicole. Thank you so much. And Deborah, you have the floor. All right. Um, so a lot of overlap here. Um, and just to say, to begin with, um, oh, I'll, let, I'll let you get queued up. Do you want to come up here? No, I'll, you, I'll just, you, you, you can watch me. And when I push here, you can push there. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, good. One second. Let me just get the right way. Perfect. Uh -huh. All right. Um, we actually started planning for this year in 2009 with our partners all across the region. Um, and we are completely dependent on our partners and are so grateful for Visit Rochester and I Love New York, which allows us to do what we have a reputation that's so much bigger than our organization outside of our little house. Uh, the Anthony Museum can only have 35 people at the landmark at a time by fire code. Um, so in 2017, when I Love New York did the campaign, the special commercial celebrating New York's public history, which was also New York State's separate centennial, we hit capacity uh, and actually had to we went from uh, where it used to be on, an, on a good day, we'd get 35 visitors. We were doing 10 tours and 150 visitors uh, in a five hour day. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a great, exciting problem to have, but uh, posed an interesting piece for us. So our goal in the last two strategic plans has been to really think and strategize about how to take Susan B. Anthony's brand, which is internationally recognized, and leverage it for tourism. 
uh, not to drive attendance to our site because that is not our current need uh, at the moment, but how to really um, help New York um, and our region leverage it more. And so that, that's really what our focus has been. Um, and we, for us, we're motivated by the inspiration, the notion that Susan B. Anthony is as relevant, if not more so, than she was 10 years ago. We actually thought, how are we going to get people interested in suffrage history in 2009? Uh, but people couldn't be more interested in voter suppression, voting rights, women's issues uh, than they are right now. So um, the 19th Amendment, as you already know, this is not new news, uh, but it, the nickname for the 19th Amendment was the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, although she wasn't living at that time. Uh, what we know is a lot of people know very little about the history, and they're very emotionally connected to it. So we had actually at our dinner um, last week, we had 30 people fly in from out of town to be at her 200th birthday celebration. We've never had an out-of-state out of, out of state draw uh, for people to come, and, it, and it's that whatever their connection is, um, even though sometimes they don't know much. So, um, so we started celebrating Susan B. 200, and we're going to be doing that all year. Um, and in Rochester, we're particularly focusing on that connection between, go back one more, um, between Susan B. Anthony and Rochester, because uh, when I I have the, what I call the cornfield experience. When I go anywhere, to any town in America, they want to take me to the place Susan B. Anthony once was. Um, and more often than not, it's a cornfield where there used to be a Grange Hall, or there used to be a train station, or there used to be a something. And for them, that's like the big thing, which is great. But what we really want is people to think, Susan B. Anthony, Rochester, New York. It's a destination. It's a place to come. And uh, that, different than just connecting with her and her place. So. Um, so uh, it's also, this is our 75th anniversary as a museum, although we got our charter in 2012. We started in 1945. It was the 25th anniversary of <coughs> Suffrage Centennial. Uh, uh, and people thought, what well, wasn't Centennial, sorry. People thought um, we were going to forget the history. And so we were organized, and we were all volunteer from 1945 to 1992. So we are one of the oldest historic sites celebrating women's history. And as a National Historic Landmark, of the 2,300 National Historic Landmarks, only 10% are directly related to women's history. So we really are a premier location. And uh, the biggest driver for people to come to us are people who are interested in National Historic Landmarks and internationally known sites. Uh, so that's what we want people to know to, to come here. Um, the, um, there's the National Women's Suffrage Commis con uh, Commission. Uh, they will be coming to Seneca Falls <coughs> for convention days, and they're doing a lot of promoting uh, there. Senator Gillibrand is one of the representatives, and there are three other people from New York State that are part of that. Um, the, um, and then there's the State Commission, which uh, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul is our chair, and the commission has been fabulous. Um, but they're, again, also on so many different levels, as Ross mentioned. It's tourism, it's promotion, uh, it's all kinds of different things. But uh, here's a little, a quickie promotion that, uh, that the Suffrage Commission's created for us. So. And you know that's connecting with our heritage as a, a progressive state that led the nation. It was really when New York passed women's suffrage, it was the first state east of the Mississippi, and then everything was history fast thereafter. So uh, connecting with that identity. Um, when the commercial, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, when the commercial was aired in 2017, we ha we were overwhelmed with visitors who said things like, "We've always wanted to come," uh, and we always, where did you? And they said, "Well, we saw the commercial in Vermont. We saw the commercial in Pennsylvania. We saw the commercial in Ohio." Um, it was clearly a driver for people coming to our site and our location. Um, Rochester has its own brand related to Susan B. Anthony Centennial, and we're working on local pride and celebration with that. And so, uh, this is the logo that we're doing um, and promoting locally. Um, and there's all kinds of events. Rochester is doing um, connections around women's history. Uh, all of our arts and cultural organizations. The RPO did the opera about Susan B. Anthony uh, last week. We're, it, it's just exciting. That, People are fantastic. buying into it. The one at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yes, same same opera. The mother of us all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gertrude Stein's Gertrude opera. Gertrude Stein's a little obtuse, but yeah, it was <laughs> the music's good. <laughs> uh, the um, this year, the and you can you know New York is pretty much featured at this float, which was in the Rose Bowl parade. Um, mm -hmm. I marched with a hundred women behind the float, uh, mm -hmm. and we represented the house there. Um, you know, I don't know how many millions of people watched the Rose Parade, but it was it's 23 million for the TV audience. I saw it, um, but I didn't see you. I, no, I, I, I'm in white with a big hat. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, and um, the National Women's Hall of Fame and the Anthony Museum were part of the partnership. All this was actually done by a local group. And we won the theme for the day of the Rose Bowl Parade, so it was a huge social media opportunity and promotion opportunity. So um, the, um, yeah, uh, and, and what we, learned, and I think this is a, a tourism opportunity we want to continue with, there are 
tying in with what the Finger Lakes Tourism Council is doing, there are a whole lot of women who are business leaders around the country who connect really well and identify with our history and our heritage and who have no clue all of what you can do in New York when you come here. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great marketing opportunity. Probably not efficient because it's one person at a time, but their influence is, is great and significant. So um, on the left is the woman who's creating the rover helicopter for the Mars Project from NASA. Uh, in the middle is Dolores Huerta, who's a known um, labor activist. Uh, and my wife, Emily Jones, who's a retired chemist from Kodak. So, mm -hmm. yes. um, and it was, it was really, it was so much fun to be a part of the Rose Parade. And it was actually a bonus that the ducks were playing in the Rose Bowl, which is my alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> and that they won by one point. Kind of makes it an absolutely wow. perfect yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, great game. Did, yeah. you to, did you go to the game? One of the things that, that I think, when we look at 2021, that we really want to move toward, and you can go ahead and say, but, is um, the Votes for Women History Trail was established by, it's an omnibus act of Congress and it establishes a crescent from Rochester to Fayetteville and includes all the key sites. Um, it was passed in 2009, but they've never had an appropriation. We went into sequester um, on the budget. And I really think that we need to continue to advocate for federal funding to do the development because this helps really reach international audiences because the gateway through the National Park Service is huge for us. Um, and so I've not given up hope that we will be working to really develop this. However, I have to say since 2009, the assets that we have developed in New York State, thanks to the support of Empire State Development, have been incredible. So there's so much more now to put into this already ready to go in terms of leverage features. <laughs> so it's very exciting. Um, the um, National Park Service is featuring uh, women's history in all their sites, uh, in, as well as at the Women's Rights I'm sorry, as the Women's Rights Park site as well. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, one of the things that we knew is uh, what we did with Votilla is we had to get off site to be able to accommodate a larger audience. And in 2017, we took 30 reenactors, um, particularly a very diverse group of reenactors, because people tend to think of uh, middle, middle class white women in white suits, and that's not the suffrage movement. It's not how it started. It started as a radical social reform movement with abolitionists in, in New York State. Um, so we had that visible representation. And we spent five days floating on the canal from Seneca Falls back to Rochester. Uh, hoping that would be a tourism draw, and learn, no, it's not, because if you have the one week, you just have the one week. Mm -hmm. So for 2020, we intentionally said, let's put a bunch of things happening during tourism season that involve our partners and scatter them out. So if you're coming at a particular time, you could tie in. And so that's the concept behind Votercade. Um, you've got a postcard, and I think those are on the phone have that packet as well. Um, we have five site partners uh, for this, and we start at Ganondagan in May. Uh, we're thrilled to be going to the New York State Equal Rights Heritage uh, site in Auburn. Uh, we go to Mount Hope Cemetery, which has a lot of interest because of the huge response we got in 2016 to the cemetery. The Rochester Public Market, um, it's a local audience that's totally different. And as a museum, we want to be engaging new audiences. Um, then we have incorporated our Suffrage City Parade. Um, this will be our fourth year, and this will be our last year. Um, this year, we're inviting women who represent a particular sector. Uh, so we have some judges who are going to show up in their robes. We have nurses who are showing up with nurse paraphernalia. We have Olympians who are showing up um, representing their sport. And anybody that you uh, think might want to be represented um, would be great. The parade is its a modest parade. It's one mile. We've had 700 people participating. I think last year we had 100 people show up to watch. Um, but I think it's going to be, and it, and it is a great tourism draw. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, then we wrap up at the Finger Lakes uh, Tourism Center in Geneva. So. Um, Three of those partners didn't even exist when we started planning, so we're really excited. <coughs> it's a three-hour program um, it, that we're doing. Uh, it's actually focused on voter suppression and voter rights and how to have civic conversations on difficult issues. Um, it's intergenerational intentionally. It's kind of got a festival feel to it. Most of the sites are building programming around the weekend also in addition to that. So um, we just hope that it was, as we said, leveraging Susan B. Anthony, mm -hmm. um, hopefully, as a draw. So that's the, the big program that we'll be rolling out in the summer. Um, you'll see Rose. She is our 1917 Model T that we've borrowed. Uh, and Rose was, the yellow Rose was a symbol for woman suffrage, so we nicknamed the car Rose. If you have a need or would like to have Rose, we had to buy a trailer, and we have possession of this car for one year. So if you want her to show up somewhere, <laughs> let me know. Uh, and this gives you a sense. We're really doing that same crescent of the Votes for Women Trail. Um, we you don't see Seneca Falls here, but that's where we're recognizing and celebrating and all the other events that are on the calendar as well. Uh, and, um, so we're really thrilled to be doing that um, and, and delighted to have a Market New York grant to help us for the promotion with Voter Gate. Um, this has been planned by a volunteer committee that's been working for two years to develop the programming and all, all of this, the, the pieces to it. Uh, and they always had, we had two budgets, the if we get the grant budget and if we don't get the grant budget. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're thrilled. Um, so um, we also have a 2020 quilt project. Uh, 
where people from around the country, and actually I think we have four from outside the country, have made these 20 inch by 20 inch squares <coughs> and tie them together. Um, there are now, we have 325 different, it's public art. Um, the long term project is that this will go to schools and libraries in small pieces to do study on our regional history and our connection. Um, we thought that all 300 squares were going to be on display with the New York State Museum, but actually they can only accommodate 125. So uh, opening for Women's History Month and through April, so when you're in Albany next, you'll probably be able to see um, the quilt. It's, uh, it's public art. Some of it's very political. Some of it's, it's pretty uh, dramatic. Some of it's a little obtuse. Uh, but we're very excited. This has been a five-year project to accumulate the 300 total so, Do you have a plan for the remaining squares that aren't going home? So we just got the news yesterday that we weren't sending all 300. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, we don't have a plan yet. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things... We can certainly talk. I have, run a mobile tour. Um, that will go to several stops throughout the summer, and we're figuring out how to do more relevant programming in and addition to it. So, putting some of them on display as part of perhaps a walking exhibit near the near our pod could be a. And we have a very simple. We use just a um, photographer's backdrop, and we can put 16 panels up mm -hmm. very easily and quickly to do that. So, so we can talk. yeah, yeah. So let's talk. Yeah, we'd love to see that. And they, they are from all around the country um, and special interest groups. And we have there is a website, so you can go see all of them in advance. Uh, and we knew that there were people who actually had made arrangements to come to Albany, so we hope we got all of those on display <laughs> if they're flying in from California. Um, the um, People don't realize that the suffrage history connects with so many different things. In our region, we've got all the reformers. You know, you, The suffragists and the abolitionists were the same people, and they're the same people who were starting in issues we're still talking about, like prison reform. Um, still, you know, at the heart of the discussions we're having now about the history of suffrage is about racism <coughs> and how it played into suffrage. And so it's it's so contemporary and so significant and a part of our New York heritage. But uh, you probably didn't know that the take me out to the ball game sign was inspired by a suffragist. Uh, when you talk about suffrage history, you're talking about transportation. You're talking about the railroad industry. You're talking about that there is almost anything that has a huge following of people who are deeply interested that connects with this history. And so that's the Beyond 2020, I believe we will continue to leverage particular audiences that connect with aspects of, of this history and this story. Deborah, could you tell us the story about yeah, how she, uh, she so inspired the The fellow who wrote the song was apparently having an affair with her. Uh, <laughs> he was married at the time. And he was so impressed with her energy. And, and if you look at the lyrics of the song, they're, they're pretty revolutionary, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't bring the lyrics with you. Um, they ended up breaking up after news got out about why how he didn't she inspired this film. <laughs> uh, but there's a whole thing about and I'm sorry I don't I didn't I apologize Christine that I didn't review the lyrics but there's a whole line it's about women's strength uh, and the ball game and, uh, so just thinking of peanuts and cracker jacks I know. It's, it's, I think, that's the song I think there are that's other, the one. I think there are other yeah, lyrics I think there are other there's verses that aren't really known it's like the one that everyone knows but I think there's a yeah. bunch of other deeper ones yes. that may be part of this yeah mm -hmm. yeah and it's not it's only three verses so it's you don't have to, I, but I, I do apologize I didn't I'm good at cramming, but I didn't. This review. might be a good tidbit for Major League Baseball to know about. Yes, and so that when what the date, like I know it's all the whole year, but isn't there a date in August that's? Uh, so there's wrong. three dates in August okay. that will be significant. Um, August 18th is the date that the Tennessee legislature voted by one vote, Barry okay. T. Byrne, uh, to pass the 19th Amendment, and that made them the the, the state 36th state at that time to ratify. Um, two days later, they actually finished all of the stuff they had to do and. Mm -hmm. and officially approved it. So the 20th, sometimes it's celebrated. Right. August 26th is the day that it was signed uh, into the Constitution. And so that's known as Equality Day. Uh, here mm -hmm. in New York, the dedication of the statue of Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is going to be on that day. Um, I know there are celebrations in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., all over the country on each of those three dates. Um, so there, there's some really great draw. And I also know that the uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame has an exhibit on women in baseball that's right. been a part of there a while, so there, there are a lot of connections. Yeah, well, there's going to be a lot of, you know, attention on the Baseball Hall of Fame this year with Derek Jeter, but, you know, this might be a good thing with MLB, and they're based here. I mean, if you want to be happy to try to set up a meeting that would be fabulous. with MLB, the head of marketing happens to be a woman over there now, so. We'd love um, to do that. Yeah, I think. She might take interest in this, and then it could possibly be on the MLB network around the country to talk about this. A great. Any time. kind of hook we can. Great time. Can do yeah, I love that. Push I know. Back I know up the Rutgers are doing right. Mother's Day, doing Women's Day on March 16th, and then uh, okay. yeah, I think the the, the induction is the uh, 26th, so July 24 to 27. If that's what you were looking for, Christine. 
at the Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. To push July that. July 24th, 27th. Eleanor found where that actually is naming Kate, right in the lyrics for this? Yeah, Katie Casey was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad, just to root for her hometown crew. Um, every Sue, Katie Blue. On a Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show, but Miss Katie said no. I'll tell you what um, you can do. And then the chorus, take, take me out the ball. Yeah. yeah. So Katie was the pseudonym for uh, yeah. Trixie. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's maybe maybe it's we great. should have um, at least the Mets and the Yankees <clears throat> to have the song in its entirety. Yeah. Which and could be a newsworthy hook yeah, know, during, be, those, yeah. during that time. And Katie Casey saw all the games, knew all the players by their first names, told the Empire um, he was wrong <laughs> all along, good and strong. When the score was just two to two, <coughs> Katie Casey knew what to do just to cheer up the boys she knew. She made the gang sing the song. That's so it's all about women in sports. Yeah. Yeah. Think, uh, yeah. So there's lots of tie-ins that we have yeah. not even discovered. I, yeah. And I love your excitement about that. Yeah. Um, Especially if they're in, in character. Yeah. Get, <laughs> get girls out on the field to sing it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Girl Scouts or whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. we, great, can, yeah. we can work on this with you. That'd be fun. That I would be it. really wonderful. It would be a, a wonderful tie-in to the whole yes. thing, and especially because baseball season is, you know, oh. right around like these these mm -hmm. these important dates. You know, yes. <coughs> yes, the heart of tourism season. Yeah. Um, we expect then, because because of the election, that uh, things will be all focused on the election and. Uh, as a museum, we have to be careful to not be partisan. It's really hard to be a progressive political uh, organization and not be perceived as partisan. Um, when we uh, get to November, then of course it will be um, coming to the <coughs> great part. Uh, in 2016, we had 10,000 people come to put their I Voted Today stickers, and 23 million people watched John Kuchko's live stream on Facebook, including uh, Barbara Streisand and the BBC called me and said, what's going on with that Ms. Anthony there in Rochester? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we anticipate that and, and I know the city is really working on figuring out some connections. To me it's more of a social media opportunity than a tourism opportunity, but we need to convert every single social media opportunity to a, you want to have a migration, a pilgrimage to come to where all this happened. So if you can't do it, in, you know, by this time it would be, you couldn't come in 2020, but make it next year, make it the year after that. And that, to me that's what, that's what we can use it to drive. Um, Susan B. Anthony and the and Queen Victoria were the two most famous women in 1900. She still, she uh, organized three international conventions and so she has an international connection and people still resonate with that. The countries where girls and women still don't have access to education and freedoms, um, she's still a draw, a big draw. Um, the, um, this is one of her trunks that after she died it went to the women's convention with her niece in Budapest. This is upstairs. So it, it's fun for us. We, we do have people, when you mentioned the Javits Center, uh, several years ago, there was a couple who signed in from Japan, and we said, what brought you here? And they said, because uh, we thought they'd say a wedding or Kodak or something, and they said, um, well, we were at the Javits Center, so we hopped on JetBlue to come to the Anthony Museum. Wow. And we often don't, we underestimate the value of Anthony brand to draw people. And that's they, what we're really They saw about. the I Love New York video playing yeah. at Javits and saw Susan B. Anthony. And said, we got to do it. So they hopped on the plane for, and we do have people who will come. There was another group, a family with a two-year-old drove up from Philadelphia, got there at 4.30. I know you've heard these stories more than once. Um, <laughs> gave them a tour and then said, what are you going to do in Rochester? And they said, well, we're driving back. <sighs> they, their nine-year-old wanted to see the Anthony Museum, so they drove up with a two-year-old, seven hours, had one-hour tour and drove home. Uh, we would like them to stay. <laughs> so uh, the, um, you know, she's, she's still, and, and now, you know, so we're looking very seriously about all of the interesting pieces around racism around, and uh, we love that people say, well, I know enough about Susan B. Anthony. They really don't, um, but we can start a conversation whether they, you like her or don't like her. She said, keep the press talking. So um, we do, we are overwhelmed um, with Twitter trolling. Uh, I guess it's a problem. Um, you know, we got, Featured, that is actually a reproduction of our front hall on Saturday Night Live that we didn't know they were going to do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> totally felt they misrepresented Susan B. Anthony on issues of women's reproductive freedom, but like we said, better to keep them talking. <laughs> and, uh, the rest of the skit was good, except yeah. that one line. Was this it was last Saturday Night? No, no this it was, was a year last year. Ago, oh. yeah. um, so every time that the news focuses on women's issues, it's a, an opportunity for us to tie in and then to say, yeah, come here where it all got started and where it's really happening and, and visit the real parlor. Uh, where Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting in 1872, because um, we we really believe uh, uh, that um, Susan B. Anthony is, as I said before, as relevant today as she was 200 years ago, and uh, 
Good. So in Rochester, what we're saying is Susan B. Anthony rocks. And uh, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, sorry, go one more. Oh, sorry. sorry. I got I got him. No, go, go. Keep going. One more. There you go. Oh, okay. Susan B. Anthony rocks. Um, you have your little bag, if you're here in the room, of the five different logos we developed. We thought that Celebrate 2020 was going to be our big overall logo. But if you Google, like, Google Celebrate 2020, it wasn't unique enough. Like a million people are saying Celebrate 2020, so we've, we've pretty much dropped that and gone to the individuals. Um, and as I said, we are incredibly grateful for Visit Rochester and the promotion that they're doing. We're getting great international exposure. Um, as, as Lisa already, as Nicole already noted, we, um, you know, when, when the New York Times says you're one of the top sites to visit, <laughs> uh, we're pretty excited about it. So just thank you for all of you for doing what you're doing and come visit us. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Um, my friends have been trying to get me to visit Rochester just to visit them. Yeah, and now you have a reason to go. Now I actually a little have bit better reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now you can do it. Depending on how good a friend it is. No, I really like them, but now I really want that to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, um, I also should say we're, we were thrilled to get an Empire State Development Grant, um, which is going to help us acquire some property so that we can build a, a visitor center, which mm -hmm. will allow us. It's a modest building that we have in mind, but it'll allow us to to increase our capacity sixfold. Um, very quickly, so hopefully, hopefully you'll hear good news about that in the future as we move through a silent campaign. This is a great case study. Of, we talked about taking a historical event, moment, monument, and taking, making it a bigger tourism story. It's not just about go to visit this monument or this museum. It's that's the, the, the sort of newsworthy piece of it. But how do you mm -hmm. get people to go to that area for the other things that that's 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 there to offer from that one piece? And this is like, I think a good case study and a model that we should be looking at for other historical well, sites around. And I have to say the genius about where Empire State Development and where I Love New York has gone, because in 2009, we still had separate counties. And as a, a site, it was very difficult for us to collaborate with sites in the other counties. Um, that totally changed, and the world opened up. Uh, and now we have these incredible marketing pieces and support, and it makes so much sense, because we have so many assets that you know, a family wants to come have a whole experience, and we have all that. Mm -hmm. you, you can come for years and never do it all. Um, and it, I just cannot say enough about how I love New York and Empire State Development has flipped us into making that possible. And, and you get to see the connections easy, too, right? That you go to the Strong Museum of Play, which was founded by a woman. <coughs> who's, you know, a little, was Strong? Uh, yes. Margaret. Uh, Margaret. Margaret Strong. Margaret Strong. Um, you know, which is now the center of toys in the world. You know, if you care about history, you also have the Eastman House there. So it's always easy to make these links for travelers in terms of if you're interested in one thing, you're probably going to be interested in a bunch of things. And, and name brands. You know, people didn't know Harriet Tubman was a suffragist, mm -hmm. um, a, a very committed, dedicated suffragist. Mm -hmm. And she went to, you know, there's, there's so many things where Douglas, right? not only names that you recognize, but events that you recognize, we can own that history. Deborah, in your quest to, be, to have the national parks uh, Tell us a little bit, like, what will that actually do for you? How will that change? What will the trail do? And, and what do they have to do in order to make it an official trail? So it is an official trail. It's an official heritage trail of the national park system. Okay. Um, there were three elements to the legislation. One is that a trail would be established, and it was a unique model now, but they've rolled it out in other places. Um, the Because it's private and federal and state partners. So Ganondagon, which is now a state site, was one of the original partners. The Anthony Museum, which is a privately owned museum, is a partner. And Seneca Falls with the National Women's, um, National Women's History Park is, they would be the administrative head because it's a park service piece. But there would be funding that would allow us to do brochures, maps, publicity. Um, and I think the key piece is, uh, I think I Love New York does the best marketing for the region, but the National Park Service to be a piece of that because so much inter tra international travel gets driven by people who are in national national parks where they want to do the national historic sites. So there's that. Um, so it really would take large and small partners together and allow us to have a presentation that gives us a national international audience through federal government. Um, the second piece of that is there's a whole research project to find and locate other suffrage sites. A whole lot of that work has been being done by grassroots organizations already, um, but that's to, to create a database of all the cornfields, which right. in my opinion is not tourism, but it's really neat heritage. Um, then another piece is to connect organizations across the country that are affinity groups. So initially, the legislation was to have a two, two million dollar pots that would fund Project A and then the other two million would fund the other two. But as we said, the legislation passed. It is a National Parks Heritage Trail. Okay. It took 12 years to get it passed, okay. Louise Slaughter was the key driver. Um, and people think it doesn't exist, because, but there's never been appropriation. So all of the all the structures built, how do sites become certified, how do people join in, all of that's all written. We, all, we prepared all that, it's on the shelf, waiting for the 
um, Women's Rights Park to have permission to go ahead, hire staff, and implement the project. So, so it's really a budget issue in the federal parks? Uh, it's an interesting political issue. When we were lobbying, which we did, just so okay. you know, when we lobbied yeah. the uh, Department of the Interior is over. Right. And when we lobbied the Congress people, um, what they said is the last thing we want to do is 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 give all those liberal women in upstate New York a national voice. So there's a political piece around that. Um, so uh, I think the time will come, and I think I think long term, to have that site celebrated and created um, will serve us really well. Um, and so I, unfortunately, another volunteer organization has created what they call the National Votes for Women Trail. Um, tried to talk them off that because it's really brand confusing. Um, that's a group that's uh, working to put historic markers um, all around. So, uh, so sometimes people will say, well, that it's this other thing. Um, it's not that. So, uh, but yes, it's a National Park Service Heritage Trail. Until two months ago, if you went to the Women's Rights Park website, you could read all about it. You could read about everything that's been taken down. I'm not sure. Uh, it's an interesting um, political. Sometimes when people, <coughs> I'm, I'm aware that this gets recorded, but. Uh, when uh, people have said to us, why aren't we a national park site, which actually uh, we flunked the test of not being at risk enough. Uh, no. you know, uh, so they said, you've been doing this um, Successfully. budget to budget for so many years. There's no reason to think you can't keep doing it one for the time, which is great. But I, I've never been more grateful than in the last five years to not be a national park site where we would be beholden to uh, up the switches, the partisan switches in Washington. Um, we, we would rather be able to have our educational content be uh, have integrity. Uh, so, uh, but it does. It, it's a political piece, uh, and it's also you know because we we've, we've got um, New York is doing such great support with the state sites. I think, and then here we've got this opportunity to do the national piece, uh, and you know each one is different in terms of how it functions. So uh, we are so grateful for all our partners. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. Um, do we have any new business to, to discuss? Well, um, this was this was amazing, and we really want to continue working with you on that. Um, Rich, I want to also congratulate you on your position. I know you're still sort of getting your feet wet, but I'm hoping that in the next uh, TAC meeting that we have, which is in May, I think it's on May 8th, is that? Oh, May 5th, May 5th. Um, maybe we could do a bit of a deep dive on <coughs> the advertising and where we've been over the last few years and where we should go. Um, I, my sense is that it's, it could use maybe a refresh. So you're new. Yep. So it's always great to have the new guy to put that on your plate. Yep. So there you go. <laughs> that was on the plate already. <laughs> and, um, you know, maybe Summer's can, coming up. And Maybe we can look at all the ads over, say, the, the last four years or so, and, and um, you know, in light of, as well, of, of the issue with potential international markets due to the coronavirus, you know, impacting our tourism. You know, I, after September 11th, when we had that tragedy, uh, I Love New York played a, a really crucial role in pushing our advertising to a more local market. It enabled, um, we did a lot of different television, uh, unique uh, television commercials. We also worked for the first time with NYC and Company. I actually headed up NYC and Company at that time, and they were able to do their own for the first time ever television commercial through a grant with I Love New York. So I'm just, you know, we've got some time, a couple of weeks, but maybe we can look forward to you presenting on the ads, and, yep. and we're here to help you in any way. Yep, that's a it's perfect timing because we're, you know, mm -hmm. I'm still wrapping my head around the history yeah. and where we are right now and what that means going forward. You know, without mm -hmm. completely starting a new strategy from scratch, we know what works, what doesn't work, but how do we evolve it in the most logical sense based right. on the current needs? Perfect. And we have some, uh, some actually, some really good data. It's, uh, you, some of it's on the ESD re website, but we haven't brought it to TAC um, in that we've done, we've done some you know, professional research, obviously, and taking a look at what the performance has been. Right. So mm -hmm. um, that would be a good part of it. Probably. Right. And I know since we took attendance, we had a couple of additions. So I just, for the record, while we're still before I adjourn, <clears throat> wanted, Tamara, can you introduce yourself to the group? 
at Tanner Murray, Emerson Resort and Spa. And I just wanted to say that Emerson is planning to do some things this summer too in honor and support of the anniversary. One of the things that we're doing is creating a special um, cocktail in our restaurant, and I'm totally stealing oh. the idea of charging men more for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on record. And for also, <laughs> by the way, the Emerson is owned by a woman. So yes, mm -hmm. yes, female owned and almost entirely female managed. So we have. How do you feel about that, Matt? I feel fine about it. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay with it. Good. Well, thanks Good. for joining us, and also we're welcoming you. Um, I'm Sarah Lou of Robert Chinese. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Sure. After the oh, All right. Um, then we have some more people who join on, on the phone. phone. Is, is there anyone on the phone who didn't get to identify themselves who wants to now before we adjourn? You have to unmute yourself. Are you no, not hearing any. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So now I can. Um, did you want to end? I'm just seeing something. Okay, we'll talk about it afterwards then. Um, all right. So without any additional um, subjects, I would need a motion. So moved. Turn. Okay, Eleanor. Thank you. And a second. Is Somebody Tom or Dan still on the phone yeah. to motion for an adjournment? No, I'm pretty sure we can adjourn anyway. Yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> so, we're adjourning. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all, and we'll see you on May 5th, and appreciate your participation and, and uh, sharing with us all thank the, you. Things, the wonderful things that you're doing.